So let's get started. Um, and when I say let's get started, also always please interrupt. Let's, let's make it a bit interactive because otherwise uh, I might just be too boring, right? And I might get bored. And if I might get bored, I mean, then we again can do uh, pictures of sleeping people in the background. <laughs> and we will all publish them. We will publish them then on Twitter uh, with dubdubsss16 hashtag. Um, and if you have comments uh, that you want to do, of course, also please use that kind of hashtag. Maybe you should draw it here on the blackboard. dubdubsss16. And so be aware of all the pictures done and published there. OK, so we talk about web science. And the question, of course, that we should ask ourselves is, uh, what is web science? Uh, web science is not yet that established that we shouldn't ask this question any, anymore. And we should ask ourselves what I mean, most of you will have a discipline like computer science, social science. What does my discipline bring to the table? And what do I uh, benefit? How do I benefit from um, this integration? Now, web science, for me, is looking at the web. What does it mean, looking at the web? Because the web, I mean, I use this metaphor here in the middle, is just some, some piece of data. Is it? Well, it's actually much more. Because, as we all know, it involves people, right? It involves all kinds of people who contribute something, who build websites, whether for private purposes or whether they are a company and pro want to do uh, some transactions, sell, sell goods, or whether they want to provide some news and want you to buy it, or whether they do advertisements and want you to uh, take notes of these advertisements. And for each of these people, of course, you can look in more fine grand manner. You have a particular person. And this particular person interacts with the web as a whole, uses the web as a medium to interact with the other people. And of course, this person actually also interacts directly. Right? Not mentioned that already. We leave our traces, but sometimes to understand our traces, we also need to go off and interview people and ask them, like, what is the reason that you, you left this or that trace? What is the reason that you uh, collaborated or have not collaborated in a certain way. So that's, of course, definitely a, an area where we can no longer rely on computer science anymore, but where we need the social sciences to use the theories, but also the methods in order to understand what people are doing. And um, when we look here at the web, and we, when we look at how the web is constructed, we need to consider many dimensions that I want uh, later on to, to delve into in a bit more detail because we have all kinds of dimensions of looking at data and information. Of course, we have text. We have uh, sem the semantic web, where we really directly publish data, where we publish tables of uh, data, for example, about cities, telling how large Copeland is, what's its geographical position, but also who's the mayor, and maybe relate the mayor to his profile on Wikipedia, and his accomplishment, and his CV. So we have all kind of data uh, and, and text that we have to look at and you know, want to look at in order to understand what's going on. But the web is not just crafted by having some arbitrary piece of, of text and data, but it's crafted by a lot of processes that are regulated. How are they regulated? There are governance processes. I will have a slide on that. The whole construct is built by defining protocols. It's not that. We just put a, a, a bit of bits and bytes somewhere. Because if you just provide some bytes, no one will understand what they mean. So all these bits and bytes that are placed in some, some, on some server, they are given a sort of a meaning or a sort of a way of handling by protocols and apps that understand or follow these protocols. And on the individual level, of course, this person here is not just acting in order to fill this web. I mean, there was always initially, when you look back in the history of the web, people, why would people even want to create a website? Yeah? This was initially, for, maybe for you it's now clear that people want to express themselves. And they do a website, or they do a Facebook account, Facebook profile. Maybe that's even going bad, back, but there is a certain need to 
to interact with others or to just self-express yourself. And this is not just happening in a void, but it's coming with all kind of psychological constraints or psychological um, uh, emotions, for example, that this person has. So Nosh has asked this question, how do you form a team? And talked about something like skills. But he also talked about, uh, this came from somewhere uh, around here, that people have certain kind of emotions, certain kind of cognition that let them do something or not do something, let them consume something or not consume something. People might be interested in facts on the web or just in getting a feeling of being liked. That's all happening when this person here is involved. And how do we approach this? Well, we approach it, of course, what we try to do, what psychology tries to do is to look at micro interactions that people pursue. Right? For example, psychology tries to give them some stimulus and, and looks at the response and tries to build up some theory, some psychological theory from this. But what's happening then when we do this as a mass scale that we have sort of macro effects. When we look at the kind of patterns that Nosh presented, he said that we have these different kind of social theories of balance, of homophily, um, of a status exchange, and we can try to discover in the large overall pattern how much a certain group was motivated to participate in balance or to participate in homophily. And in the end, we have a kind of a mixture of mechanisms that make people exchange. And that's true for people forming a team. That's also true for people providing some information on the web or on Facebook or on Twitter or the likes. Now, um, another item that Nosh has touched upon is the, then the question, what is the relationship between web and internet science and, and network science. And from my point of view also, it's, he's right in saying that we don't need to delineate strictly. That's not very useful. But it's good to think once about what web science is or what it could be. There's a very nice saying by Dijkstra, who said that computer science is as little a science about computers as astronomy is telescope science, a science about building telescopes. Because astronomy really tries to explain how stars form, how our universe is created. And it's not about the science of how we build telescopes. Obviously, you need the telescope. And uh, I think already for computers, it's not exactly true. <laughs> so I think Dijkstra was a bit wrong about it. Um, because a lot of the, what computer scientists do is based on assumptions about how computers work and about engineering better computers, better in a certain way. Uh, he's not completely wrong because when we talk about computer science, when we talk about informatics, for, some of, for, for most of the work, we abstract from any particular machine. So it is true when we talk about Computer science, we want to have both. We want to talk about computing in abstract from any particular machine. And we want to talk about information in abstract from any particular engine that's driving this. We also want to talk about the actual engine, the actual machine. And I think the same is true for web science. It's a science about how the web works. And the web has protocols and the web has machines and we want to understand them, and we need to consider them when we build our theories. But web science is not limited to how the web is engineered. It's also about the structures that any collaborative system gives us. So we can exchange the web for another collaborative system. We may look at WhatsApp or Instagram, which still actually use some of the web stack um, protocols in the background. We don't see this anymore. And we will still find structures, for example, team structures, that are constant over different kind of technologies, 
allowing us to collaborate. I think it is. Uh, I would not agree with you. I, I understand that one can take this position. I don't agree with that, really. So I think that down here we have, let's say, a particular architecture of computers. Uh, Computer scientists might talk about the von Neumann architecture. We may exchange that, right? And we're doing this actually these days with not having a, a single a computer comes from the word computer that means a human who computes, right? So uh, in the in the 30s or 40s, computers meant you had a room full of people, actually mostly females, because they are more diligent, tend to be more diligent, and they were doing computations, right? And so the computer was initially a human who would do computations. And now the von Neumann architecture assumes, OK, well, you have more or less one, let's say, human who does computation. Now already we, we, have, we are changing the paradigm because we think about heavily distributed systems where you accomplish something, let's say, by a crowd of computers. And where we now talk about actually not only crowd of computers, but crowd of people that do parts of the computation. Now, when we do crowdsourcing, as we'll be talked about next week, we still talk about computer science, even if some of the computers are humans. Because it's really this principle of how to process information, distributing information, collecting results, rather than any particular hardware that we build upon. It's, it's difficult, it's a, it's a bit like, it doesn't matter, that's also a correct answer, it, but it's also a bit like, what do you define the gene pool of a population? Now, when we in investigate the gene pool of ourselves, and we have a German background, Indian background, what you will recognize all the time is that none of us is purely German or purely Indian or whatever, but that actually when you do a typical analysis, then you will discover that, uh, you are so much Neanderthal and so much uh, uh, Asian and so much uh, European and the like. And that's how I understand also these disciplines is that they are not crafted and they are not isolated from each other, but just like a population is not 100% any nation. Uh, it, it's really, we are all a mix. Yeah, so we, we're not, we, you cannot make a, a strict hierarchy. And, and why should we, right? I mean, we really want to benefit from bringing things together. Like we should benefit from bringing, bringing people together. Okay, so I think that should clarify at least my position that I take towards web science. Web science is about the web, but it goes beyond that. That's my position. And, uh, and of course, you can take a look at Wikipedia and the kind of def definition that you have there. And there it actually says, according to the uh, wisdom of the crowd, that's not always wise, that the web science is concerned with the study of large-scale social technical systems. And it considers the relationship between people and technologies, the ways that society and technology co-constitute one another, right? The web is limited by the structures, the engineering, but it's also limited by the people and how they behave and how the two of them interact. And, uh, and it also goes and talks about the impact of this on broader society. When we investigate a particular phenomenon, for example, hate speech on the web, it's not the, the phenomenon doesn't stay on the web, right? It, it changes our society. When we do shopping on the web, it doesn't stay on the web. It changes how our local towns look like, right? So because maybe some of the shops will disappear and, and move to the web. So uh, when we talk about web science, we also look and target that 
a specific kind of impact, for the better or the worse. OK, so that is my stake at what is web science. And now that we have talked about web science, Peter, you have a question? No. <laughs> I will have a slide later on. Um, I would ask you to delay your question for about an hour of my talking. <laughs> and, uh, and then I will have some slides about the history. And I think that uh, your question best fits there. OK, so what is the web? I will not talk about the internet at this point yet, but uh, talk about how to look at the web, aspects of the web at large, and then how to investigate the web. And when I talk about the past and the future of the web, I get back to the past and then talk about the internet, which is not just past, but I, I look at how it evolved over time. And, and the internet is like an older part of the web, you could say. Um, and maybe one note, what I try to do in order to give this overview here is, I try really to classify and categorize a lot. I will not be 100% correct and complete because there's always an exception. Uh, I think that's also quite, quite normal. The web is this amalgam of different things. And I had, it's, it's like a human body. You could make, draw the analogy. And uh, I was once working with a medical doctor and he never could write down really what the, medic, what the, what the body, the human body really is because he would always find the exception. You, know, you would think that you, you draw a picture of the anat anatomy of, of the human body, and you would say, the heart is on the left side. But he would say, yes, but in 1% of the cases, the heart is on the right side. Right? So, and uh, that still may still be healthy, a healthy human body to have the heart on the right side. Um, maybe you have uh, even an, uh, a heart that doesn't pump very nicely, or maybe you have lost some, some limbs and uh, uh, you may still be a, a happy person. So you, I, I'll do a classification, being well aware not, that not all of the classification will hold all the time and that there would not be any kind of exception. Still, I ask you to ask. Because like your question, I think this question is very helpful to, to clarify things uh, for you and maybe for me yeah? because I often... Uh, think while, while speaking, and uh, maybe sometimes that's good, but maybe sometimes it isn't. So don't hesitate uh, to, to clarify for yourself. So what is the web? How can we even approach it and uh, try to understand it? Um, what I thought when I asked myself the question is, let's do it in a similar way, because I'm a computer scientist, as a computer scientist would do it. Or actually, like an architect would do it. How does an architect describe a building? Well, he makes or she makes different sketches. There's not a single model that shows you how a building in the making looks like or even how uh, a building that stands in a place looks like. But it depends on which, from which point of view you look at a building, right? So from one view, it might be quite narrow. From the other view, it might be stretched for very long. And you really, to understand the building, it's not good enough to have one or two sketches, but when you look at uh, renting a flat or buying a house, in the ideal case, you have 10 different sketches of what the house looks like from different angles. Some of them are colorful, others are abstract. And when we look at the web, we should also try to approach the understanding of the web with different kind of sketches that look at it from different perspectives. And then, of course, it's not that just one sketch describes what what the whole thing is. It's rather that you look at it from the different angles. Like this famous example with the elephant looked at by the blind man. Um, okay, so how can we look at the web? I want to give you some perspectives. Maybe you, while I talk, you come up with some more and you suggest some more perspectives of how we could look at the web. We can look at the web as a device. Right? That's how I first approached the web. Oops. When, when I first encountered it. It was in 93. And for me, the web as a device was a piece of software. Actually, it was a browser at, at that time, the Mozilla browser. And actually, I was not even aware that there was something like a web server when I first encountered it. 
But obviously, you, I, I guess you all know that there is a web server in the background. If I say something and I, and I say something like adjust it now, I guess you all know that there's a web server in the background. And you don't know, please interrupt me and ask me what a web server is. Okay? I don't want to ask this question every time because then I get stuck for too long. But you, when you have the, the feeling, I, I don't really know what he's talking about, then please raise your, your finger and, and, and ask. So you have some piece of software in the background that delivers stuff for you to look at in the web browser. And you can look at all the infrastructure, whether that's a content management system that we use for the website of the summer school that you looked at, or whether it's a really large and complex infrastructure that Google is using with hundreds of thousands of compute nodes to deliver a fast search for you, right? where you have a really distributed system and uh, there are millions or even billions of queries per day. And, uh, okay, the first thing I encountered was the browser. The second thing I encountered when I first built my, of course, individual web page was, ah, there is something like um, hypertext, text with links. There is a, a place that you refer to where you put a file and then that file is called. And, uh, well, I didn't care at that point uh, about that something is transported because the software did that for me, but in order for the whole system to work, you need all kind of standards that define how does content look like, how is it transported by this protocol typically, HTTP or HTTPS for secure transport, or uh, to indicate what document do you want because you indicate the identity of the document. And there's much more stuff, and I could talk now about standards for two hours. And uh, I, I thought I don't do that. Uh, because that would cater only to a small part of the audience. Uh, but my, I will be around all week, and if you have specific questions, I will try to answer. And uh, the field is broad, even within computer science. I will not be an expert for all the different layers of the web, uh, but I can point you to, to experts. Um, so this is the web as a device. Web as a device means certain pieces of software that we start and end, uh, certain pieces of standards that allow us to look at it. And also these standards actually influence how we will interact with it. I'll give you an example for that later, how the interaction is, is limited by the standards and by how we follow them. Then we have, of course, the web as content. Now, <clears throat> even when I put up this slide, I thought, well, what is content on the web? It's text and hypertext. Well, but of course, that's not sufficient. I mean, um, we have a lot of images. There was uh, uh, Ramesh Chain, he's a famous multimedia guy. He recently posted something and said like, like uh, 10, 20 years ago, we let images intrude our text. So images were an extension to text. And nowadays, on much of the social networking sites, it's rather that text intrudes the images because a lot of stuff that's shared is really only image with a little bit piece of text. All well, the same is true for videos, right? That, and this is a large part of the web nowadays. And, and probably actually underexplored by this community. We often like to focus on text because it's easier accessible for all kind of data science uh, approaches. But actually a lot of what's happening is now you know, images and, and video and audio. And of course it's more than that. Uh, Nosh has talked about, it's about interaction, about games which are much harder to assess unless you have logging data, for example, about what people are doing. Um, maybe for some people it is text, but it's available in a different format. Like uh, I know blind people, blind software developers, and they may use Braille reading interface or a screen reader. Um, and of course you only not only have text or a kind of specific kind of text, like mathematics, which is then not linear text, but mathematics really is two-dimensional how you position the Greek characters over or under each other uh, gives a different meaning to what you're reading. And that actually, for example, gives a problem then to the screen readers. How do you read a mathematical formula to a blind person? And so what I talk about here is mostly human consumption. But then we also have things for machine consumption. Um, data or metadata, Ontologies, that's now available en masse on the web. 
So when we talk, I don't talk much about the semantic web in this talk, so it's my favorite pastime. Yeah, too. Um, but we now have about three trillion pieces of fact that form the so-called schema.org standard that Google collects. The Google collects not only text nowadays, but also facts from the web. They may be wrong, so maybe it should not be confused with true facts. But um, Google collects three trillion statements uh, that conform to some schema.org ontology and, and uses these pieces of data to enrich your search. And of course, you can talk about whether it's free content or, or paid content and, and how that content is brought to you. Another very important dimension that I think is often neglected when talking about the web, I mean, when we talk about the web, most people in the first place see the content. You see the text, maybe you even see the data. But what is often neglected is that it's a whole bunch of stakeholders with a whole bunch of different motivations. And when we talk about successful or not su unsuccessful platforms, it's often, very often about what are these stakeholders, what is their motivation. And when we want to distinguish, I mean, there were some project suggestions made, and I'm not sure now whether they've been taken to, to think about what platforms in the past were successful and which similar ones weren't. It will quite often have to do with the kind of stakeholders that got attracted to these platforms or were not so much attracted. So first, of course, we can talk about people, like you and me. Huh? You and me as customers or you and me as citizens who participate, or you and me who want to just get entertained, like hanging around in the train or waiting for an airplane yesterday and, uh, um, and just being bored and not like energetic enough to do some work or so, so just seeking for some leisure time. Um, well, maybe we, we collaborate, work over the web. That's, of course, routinely done. Uh, or maybe we do software development and are motivated to produce a certain piece of software for the web. Well, other stakeholders are obviously important ones, our providers, right? So what are our providers? Well, it could be your landline internet provider. It could be your, your mobile internet provider. It could be what I called yesterday because uh, I didn't know a term for it, nested providers. Uh, that's the provider could be an internet cafe, uh, or it could be your hotel that, that's giving you the access. And uh, again, the funny thing is we have been talking about net neutrality. Who's aware of the term net neutrality? Okay, maybe how, who is not? Well, a couple of people aren't. So there is a lot of discussion about net neutrality, whether it's in the States, whether it's in Germany, or all over the place, where the question is, what are, what are internet providers allowed to do with content? And many internet providers say they, they want to prefer a certain internet con uh, web content and disprefer others. Sometimes there might be a good motivation for that. For example, when you are Skyping with another person, you're having a chat, you don't want to wait for the audio signal to arrive because then the audio signal is interrupted and you cannot really talk to each other. So in a way, that would be nice to have some preferential treatment. But what does this preferential treatment also mean? It might mean that Google is paying some internet providers to really transport the Google content really fast. And some startups may not be able to pay this amount to the internet providers and which would mean that the startups would be disadvantaged in delivering content to you. So it's actually not so easy to then assess whether the principle of preferring content or dispreferring content would be actually good for you or bad. And the internet providers argue, yeah, so there is certain content that needs to reach you quickly and others which don't, but there is also this thing that then some people could buy quick access to you. And the funny thing is in this domain, we looked for good assessments from an economic perspective. 
Uh, we talk again about utility. That term was uh, before, and we, we want to maximize utility for everyone. What is a better model? The one where the internet providers are neutral and all content is treated the same, and maybe sometimes your audio stream is maybe interrupted, but also the startups have the same opportunities as, as Google, or the other way around, where some stuff is preferred. We have not found a single article that argues at a level of sophistication needed to make a case for or against net neutrality. And already now, regulations are happening. I mean, we all have ballpark opinions about it. But there's no solid research on saying net neutrality is good or bad because of this or that. There are some very simple papers which are just not worth it, really. <laughs> so. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, that's true. So maybe you will have then to pay for the quick services and the, the, the well, the, the, the lesser services come for free. Actually, that's happening already now a lot when you go to a hotel. Like quite often, the hotel gives you a free login for some very basic internet connection. And if you want to have full HD streaming to your Netflix, Amazon Prime account, you need to pay the hotel some extra fee. Right? That's happening there. It's happening with the mobile providers. So mobile providers don't provide net neutral access. But until now, the landlines were still net neutral. Well, uh, Google can afford to pay, so yes. Monop monopolies or um, oligopolies, where a few people pay, uh, are able to pay and others aren't, are more likely to occur when the principle of net neutrality is violated. Yeah, again, that, that's an interesting discussion. Do you want to pay for everything alike, or do you focus on a few things? I mean, in India, there is now this discussion because Facebook had the intention to provide an, an, a web light allowing only access to Facebook and Wikipedia and, I don't know, maybe some selected e-commerce partners for free to everyone. But the pro problem, of course, also is that this gives you a very limited entry into the internet and the web. And it's not clear yet whether that would create more harm uh, than it would provide benefits in the long run. Because it would create these monopoly structures and would exclude others. And uh, I think actually it would lead to more harm in the long run. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. But it's not a case of net neutrality. Because the way I understand net neutrality is basically always from the side of the ISP. If the user wants to pay for a service or wants to pay for a faster internet connection, that's one thing. But the discussion about net neutrality is basically based on ISP side and whether ISPs should provide, should transfer different sorts of data with different speeds. And or collect in a certain way the money for that. Yeah, exactly. But so, it's an so right now. Right yeah, so right now, you're right. Right now, I mean, you, I mean, I'd pay, let's say, for a 30 megabit connection, but I could upgrade to a 100 megabit connection, paying more money, right? But then, for the, provi for the, the, the web platforms, uh, it's completely neutral about what, which web platform I uh, reach. They are not distinguished right now by my, by my landline provider. And that's what net neutrality is about, right? But then, they, ISP might go to, to ask these web platforms to provide also money, so they would have a two-sided income. But it's about, of, in the end, of course, of preferring or non-preferring content. Yeah. So if 
you uh, this kind of thing comes in, for example, if a feature which is a preferred over other, the user might have to create another sub to that. Is that what you're saying? But uh, it's a difference where the user pays for a service and the user that pays mm -hmm. when you buy the product, right? And how that product is set up is completely irrelevant if you think about the ISP side of things because they get Netflix to pay money so that you can watch things faster. Yeah. You might be more likely to pay Netflix so that you can access that, but it's still the ISP and the negotiating agency that yeah. But it's sort of like, um, initially, it ni initially it was very um, clear cut, um, sort of like, as you say, so there was the original discussion, it's about whether someone else pays. But I think, for example, the Indian example with Facebook access, uh, I don't remember the, now the name of that. Um, yeah, that's sort of intermingling things already. Well, so, but we don't need to sort of like, I think we understand the room of possibilities, and we don't need to get hung up with one particular term now. Sorry, it's, you are not loud enough, speaking loud enough. Maybe we should uh, have the microphone sent around, because otherwise I just don't understand. And less so the other peers. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you did your advertisement, then I would like to move on. <laughs> Okay, so Pavi, you made your case? Uh, <laughs> no, but it's good. I mean, uh, um, so you see, there's a lot of like incentives, motivations behind these kind of stakeholders. And of course, when we talk about peer-to-peer -peer and, and so on, there's other kind of motivations. Well, then of course you have the, what I call your platform operators, any kind of shop, any kind of website uh, that's offering something. Um, and of course you have government. Right? PRISM was mentioned before as a way of collecting data from all of, all of us, actually, and analyzing it and spying into our private life. So here I have software developers as web engineers. Okay. I would put them there. And the second was? Web scientists. Web scientists. Well, that's a good question. Um, all it depends where, where they are working, yeah? So you could even say uh, in government you have a lot of web scientists. They want to understand your behavior. Um, obviously, software, some of the software developers will be web scientists. Some of the, the companies who offer something want to understand. For example, uh, Nosh gave this example of Sony try to better understand customer churn. Uh, so they would be here, some web scientists, uh, even if, let's say, hired on a, on a temporary basis, uh, like uh, Nosh and his team were. So that would be here, yeah. So web scientists are in a way all over the place. Um, yeah, and then you have government here as stakeholders. And uh, of course, for various reasons, right? Uh, understanding what you are up to, whether you plan a terrorist attack or, well, is it, you could say, I, I would agree that finding out about terrorist attacks up to some limit of intrusion uh, is definitely a valid purpose of government. But of course, some governments go also much further in investigating whether you relate, for example, with people who voice their opinions. And you are punished with a social score uh, when you sort of like um, interact with dubious elements. Whatever, dubious according to government, not to my definition, right? That's to government definition. So, uh, and of course, government always has an interest and should have an interest in protecting citizens, uh, protecting minors, for example. I think that's a, a, um, a valid concern that government tries, for example, to, um, to um, work against child pornography, for example, right? or child abuse or the like. So there is definitely also a valid uh, interest of, of government to interact here. 
Um, and of course, also the government, maybe in the best case, they also want to learn what people really want. And they, they want to learn about through e-participation and participatory approaches in the, in the good case. Maybe in the, in the worst case, they rather want to abuse this understanding in a certain way. So um, we talked about the stakeholders. That's one sketch to understand the web, like what are stakeholders, what is their motivation. Then another way to understand uh, the web is through processes. Yeah, so when you want to understand how the web works, for example, you need to understand the standards processes. Standards processes are also very interesting. I mean, standards are done, I said before, for things like the hypertext markup language or the HTTP protocol. But it's not ending there. And I said, like, I could talk now forever about standards. Um, it's also quite funny to understand how this process works. Who influences a certain standard and how and for which reason? Uh, that's a, a difficult thing. Uh, and then, of course, some standards are defined and never really used by the world. And sometimes the world agrees to something and it's not really in one of the official standardization committees and maybe later enters the picture and is becomes standardized. And, of course, there are some, some standardization committees that are important for us to know as web scientists. W3C is one, the World Wide Web uh, Committee. Uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force is one. Uh, you have the, the RFCs, um, requests for comments, where a lot of things are, are formulated, and you will find others. So, but, but these are among the most prominent ones. Uh, we have processes, for example, like something like domain name registration. And that's, again, a hierarchical um, process that's going on. It's dominated. I don't even, I, I forgot by what is dominated now. I think it's kind of an association in the States. I can, yeah, uh, which is related to IETF also. And, but uh, again, so there's a certain process uh, that is also hierarchically going down. So we, well, one might need to understand that. You have the routing that's also dictated by the providers, which might be under governmental control. So when at the, at the Chinese conference, there's always the great Chinese firewall that blocks something, then people, of course, unblock it also. Um, but there, there is something that makes it uh, a bit hard. I mean, it's not limited to China, right? I mean, you can go to, to other countries like Malaysia, Iran. There, there, there are many places where some things are blocked for various reasons. In Germany, also, some things are blocked um, that might have to do with the GEMA and what, what they block. <laughs> um, so there, there are different kind of, of things that are blocked, not all, sometimes versus the routers, sometimes via, via other means. Um, you have all kinds of regulations. Some of it I mentioned already are legal processes that regulate. And, uh, and uh, I think Nicolaus Forke will talk a bit about that tomorrow. Uh, legal things might be copyright, where, where it's enforced. Uh, I still remember I was once talking about uh, copyright issues in our web science course, and then my, my Russian students uh, were first looking at me, and then they were laughing at me. <laughs> uh, and, uh, well, there are other stuff like hate, uh, hate speech. It's, of course, also dif differing quite a lot. So in Germany, you cannot say, you're not legally allowed to say certain things that have to do with Nazi past that you might be allowed to say in the States. Just as one example, I, I'm, probably there will be other ways around too. So it's a complicated thing. And then, of course, you have also private regulation. Like uh, is that, um, I think it was by, by Lessig, code is law. And for example, what I always like to have here as, a, um, as an example is the nipple double standard, right? Um, I deliberately choose not to show pictures to illustrate that now. But uh, at Facebook, for example, female nipples are forbidden, but male nipples are allowed, which is a bit funny for us Europeans, at least for Germans, I would say. Uh, um, and uh, this is a kind of a, a, a funny choice. It's a private regulation, which even leads to the fact that sometimes some magazine covers that you find at, at every corner here uh, at magazine stalls are forbidden on Facebook and, and, and led to the blocking 
of some, some major magazine covers uh, you would have here in Germany on, on Facebook. Um, and, uh, and of course, when I talked before here about, you could say, these kind of slides talk about web as content, web as stakeholders, web as a process. Uh, these are sketches of how the web looks like and how it's created. Uh, and then as web scientists, we also look at the web just as a means for mirroring what's happening in the world. I think a lot of what Noche described was in this sense that the real activity of people uh, just is represented within these massive online player games, right? So it's, it's quite not a perfect mirror of what's going on, but it's a, a mirror with some distortion, like every time we use a tool to look at something, we have some distortion. So the web is a, is a tool to look at what's going on with a certain level of distortion. And what kind of practices do we see? I just give you some examples here. Also maybe some examples which are really hard to observe with this tool, right? Self-expression is something we can look at. Well, maybe that's not too hard to see in, in certain areas. We have the dark web. Um, even before Nosh mentioned that, gold, I had gold farming. He explained that already. Um, we have identity theft. Right? That's happening a lot, using the web as a tool to learn about others and then use that to commit some fraud. Um, we can observe all kinds of relationships. It's also quite interesting. Yeah? Some relationships would probably be hard to uh, investigate at that scale. So you can look at breakups. I mean, people have done that and published web science papers about that. Like, how do people behave before and after a, a breakup with a romantic um, affiliation? Um, you have things like mopping or stalking that you can, can look at and, and you may want to understand, that you may want to stop, actually, which, which are big topics, for example, in the schools, right? Topics like mopping or sexting or uh, all things related to that. And of course, you can look also at more beneficial factors like counseling or participatory processes. Um, what some of our researchers did, for example, Christoph Kling, he looked at sex lives that otherwise are not so easily um, introspectable, right? For example, there is, um, uh, he has collected some data about, I don't remember the website now, was fetish something. And he tried to sort of like understand what kind of fetishes are preferred by which groups of people. And you can collect that online. And, uh, and, and there were some papers that looked at uh, prostitution patterns uh, because there is even some, were some, some websites uh, that scored this kind of service and uh, that revealed more about certain kind of customer relationships than you could find by any resource uh, in the real world. Um, there are also new social or anti-social practices. I, I, I put a question mark here for the new because I'm not fully sure whether they're really new and you can always say, yeah, but some part of these social practices existed before. Uh, we have a lot of automation. Uh, we have a lot of Twitter bots. So a lot of the, the likes of politicians might come from bots, right? I'm not sure how many bots uh, provide their likes for uh, what Trump is saying, but I think it's happening all, all around the different parties. Um, you have online dating bots. Uh, Nosh suggested uh, this uh, when, he, uh, when he talked about the matches, right? Not only establish whom to talk to, but and also what to say. Maybe you don't even have to go to the date anymore. <laughs> well, there may be other reasons. But, uh, and, and then, of course, there's also um, where you have online dating bots, of course, a lot uh, for fraud, right? There are these, these websites that have much more male customers than female customers. So they, uh, have pro there were some sites that were found to have programmed bots to suggest you the, the, the male would see a female counterpart, but in reality, the only thing that uh, he was seeing wa was a female bot. Um, so there is this is a kind of new kind of, of practice uh, that, that's uh, introduced here, right? Um, then you have something like smart contracts, where, again, you do an automation of what was happening before between humans 
you close a contract and that's processed fully automatically. There was also a major scandal recently because I think the, this platform was Ethereum and uh, yeah, I've And, uh, and uh, basically what I think what they say on this platform and other platforms is the platform is the contract. No matter what the platform does, it's always right. And of course what's, what has happened then also was that there was a kind of bug in the platform and some people could commit fraud by exploiting the bugs in the platform. But because the definition of the contracts was what the platform is doing and how it's handling the contracts is always right. Even the hacking was not completely illegal. <laughs> so that's of course a new kind of, uh, I mean, there are some ways to attack this even from a legal perspective, but it's not so easy then to even say if, if you, you make the, the legal platform to be the definitive contract and you do the contracts automatically and then some people exploit that, it's even not easy to argue that what the app use of the platform was, was really illegal. But even digital rights management actually is a kind of a smart contract that prohibits you to do something like um, send a movie to a friend such that the friend could watch it. Then we have new practices like what I hear said with quantified everything, well, the Fitbits and the like, of course, these quantify things that we could have never measured before. And uh, mirrors what we do in the real world. Uh, we have a lot of that with Internet of Things, Web of Things. And that might be about the physique. Uh, I mean, a lot of people work in web science in new area of not only measuring what are you doing physically, but what are your psychological traits. So big five are appearing in many papers where people look at how can I just look at your Facebook profile and infer how neurotic you are, for example, right? And then derive something from that, maybe give you a different kind of advertisement, maybe not hire you, maybe, maybe hire you because you're neurotic. Neurotic people are good for some tasks, right? You want to have them as controllers. You probably don't want to have them um, in creative media, but uh, as controllers, neurotic people are really good. <laughs> and uh, so, you become more of an open book, right? Because of ha handing over data about what, what are you doing and then how you feel about it. And um, well, you have of course new threats to internet security and safety. So we're back to this kind of picture. And I tried to explain that picture a bit by looking at the web from these different angles, from the technical angle, from the people angle, from the angle of processes, from the angle of this picture just mirroring what's happening in the world. And, uh, and you see there are many questions that we try to answer uh, by this way of proceeding. The question is then even when we talk about what is web science, is it a discipline or is it an interdisciplinary endeavor or a transdisciplinary endeavor and I'm never quite sure how one is separated from the other. Um, but uh, maybe some of the people here are better at epistemology and can, can answer that question. Um, now, the next question that then comes is, once we have described what the web is, and what web science is, how do we investigate the web? And um, one core vehicle, of course, for us as web scientists should be to create web observatories and capture data and capture methods and do science that's reproducible. The problem within web science is that very, very often we do data analysis, whatever the data is, whether it's interviews, whether it's survey data, or whether it's log data from user interactions, that that data is hidden away somewhere. And we only publish papers that then report on some finding. And quite often 
it's unclear to everyone else whether what has been done in that paper is methodologically sound. And we know from history that very, very often what is done by all of us is faulty and cannot be reproduced. There have been um, some famous cases. For example, there was a famous um, paper by, I think it was Rogoff was the name, uh, and, and team, and it was a paper about the connection between national debts and national growth of the, the gross domestic product. And they did some really intricate analysis, and the finding was that, that about 90 or 100 percent of national debts in relative to the gross domestic product, the um, growth the economic behavior of the nation would suffer. And that influenced political discussions of leaders of different nations. Five years later, some people who investigated their Excel sheets found that there was a bug in the Excel sheets. So this team influenced national political discussions at all levels around the world. And in the end, there was a bug in the Excel sheet. And what they found was that, well, there seemed to be a kind of a point, a turning point, where the national debt would influence the growth. And once the Excel sheet was cleaned of that bug, there was no such turning point. So obviously, I mean, they're, they're human. They do wrong. We, we're all, as scientists, uh, make mistakes. So we cannot completely avoid mistakes. But what we can try to achieve is to try to achieve at least some reproducibility. So if people later come back and look at the data, they can say, ah, you did this and this analysis. There's a mistake in your assumption. When we redo it, we end up with a different picture. And we see this happening in, in medical in, uh, investigations a lot, right? Where also a lot of the medical investigations um, is done wrongly. And then there are, in medicine, there are a lot of these meta-investigations where people do an investigation of a large number of investigations to come up with a conclusion. And then they classify previous investigations as whether they're sound or not, how do they contradict each other and try to come up with some conclusion. And it's very baffling how many medical investigations and stuff published in major journals is just methodologically flawed. You will not get rid of all the flaws, but maybe if we collect data, if we do provide the methods, then we can sort of like um, come up with web science conclusions that are more robust or correctable. <coughs> um, Jerome will later on talk a bit about what we are doing here in Copelands uh, with our network collection. And um, he will also talk about this in a way to give an example of, of things he has been doing uh, with other students in order to well, allow for this reproducibility. Um, why do we want to have these observations? Understanding means collecting data and uh, describing data, analyzing data, modeling, predicting, repeating. I just mentioned quite a lot. And there are already with the collecting phase quite a lot of problems. Um, the first problem that you always said is the legal or ethical. Uh, the funny thing here is something that we in computer science still have to learn is that not everything that we can collect we are allowed to or should collect. And uh, I think especially in the computer science there is still rather little awareness that not everything that is available on a website is for you to crawl and use. Um, sometimes it's just plainly disallowed by the provider. Oh, and that, of course, may lead you to some lawsuit. Um, sometimes it's just that uh, you, by, by crawling things, you might intrude the privacy of individuals. And the, the problem is that, in a way, quite often, what you should actually do very early, early is to get consultancy from a lawyer. So. Uh, so yesterday, it was just yesterday when I discussed with, uh, no, two days ago, with Nikolaus Forgo, 
who comes tomorrow. And there, is, there are some possibilities, for example, in Germany, what research can do that a company would not be allowed to do. Uh, but in a way, it's best to, to ask early. And even if it is allowed, then it, sometimes the question is whether it's is ethical, right? Um, one case where I was, got very enthusiastic about was, for example, to look at data that migrants leave, right? We had a lot of uh, refugees coming from Syria last year to Germany. I thought, wouldn't that be great to learn better how they behave? And then I talked to my colleague from social sciences, Susan Halford in Southampton, and she said, oh, that's a very problematic case to, to gather data. Why? I, I would not have even thought about it. Because they are vulnerable. It could happen that we collect data about them, maybe interview them, and later on the police comes and says, you have to give us your data. And they are vulnerable. They would not be protected. If the police has a case, we would have to hand over the data. And maybe the migrants would reveal something to us that would be used against them by the police. So you may have then certain ethical or moral limits on what you can do in order not to, uh, yeah, to, to have harmful effects for people that you involve in your studies. But you would have to do it in a way that even you would no longer know who that is. It's very hard to have complete anonymization, if not even impossible. I mean, you can only meet so many people, for example. Right? So it's very, I don't say it's a no-go, right? I mean, definitely people look at, at migration and collect data. But you have to think upfront about how do you handle that? Can you achieve this complete level of anonymization? And then, of course, for example, when you do crawling, it even, well, the, you, it may be hard to crawl everything. So here is this picture of, of the web, the, the bow tie structure of the web. Who has not seen this before? Well, quite a couple of people. So this is a very old picture of what the web structure was like about 15 years ago. And I think it was collected by some, done by some Yahoo researchers or so who had access to their crawl. And you see it's a very tiny number of web pages, about less than 200 million web pages, so just like a, a fraction of today's web. And, but I guess the structure of the web is still very much like that. And namely, you have a central core of web pages that are all connected to each other, meaning that you can start in one web page and navigate, browse through any other web page in that core. But there are some other 40 million pages that lead out, for example, into the core, but you cannot move into these 40 million web pages. At least not by surfing around on the web. Of course, by other means. How would you think a, web, a search engine provider would even know about these pages? So here are pages where you can move out of these pages, but you cannot browse into these pages. So how do you think that the web service provider, the search engine provider, even knows that these pages exist? Hmm? No? No, because that's what I, how I defined these. These are basically the ones that are not linked into. Maybe you're going in the right direction. No, there are no, there are no ping bags. No, it doesn't help. How do you even know that a particular web page exists here? No. Yes. And how? Well, cookies could be a partial answer. Most often that would 
At, at that time, that was not so much the answer. But it, it could potentially be, yeah. For example, when you have a web server log, you have something like a referral page. Right? So even when you, when you craft a page and you don't tell anyone how to reach that, and there is no link to that page, your browser has a referral page. And, and others may see where you come from. So you see, that's again actually a place where you as a user of the web or a web scientist, you need to understand even the protocols in order to find this, let's say, one fourth of the web. And without that, you, you might think that fourth of the web doesn't even exist without knowing the protocols. And then, of course, there are the web pages that don't link out, but where people link into. I mean, they are easy to spot. Right? You just start somewhere here and do the crawl, and you find these web pages. And then there are some of these uh, tendrils where this part links out, but it's not linked back, or, or the other way, uh, or, or you have shortcuts from here to here, and so on. And you have disconnected islands, even with these disconnected islands. So they don't link out. And you don't link, and, and the, the core doesn't link in, and they can still, to some extent, not completely, be discovered, for example, by search engine providers. Everywhere. I mean, dark web is just like um, a metaphor, right? That it's not that it's that hidden. But it's all out there. I mean, yeah. Um, I think there. Hmm? It's, there, there is no special area, sort of like. Let's come back again. This was the internet question. Yeah, the, the, the deep web is a different story. But I, I think that was not the question. So the deep web is rather the web where you have a web page. Everyone, for example, can access. Maybe it's a password protected. But let's assume you have a, a web page everyone can access. And you ask a query in order to get to the results. And you can only access the results via a query. That's a typical deep web. And then the question is, you must ask the query. Now, the search engines sometimes try to guess queries that they could ask in order to reach the content. And uh, you only find the content when you ask queries. Um, yeah, I mean. It's a kind of a deep web, yeah. I mean, typically, it's more that you want to explore the database of someone, of, let's say, uh, a shop provider. Right? So of course, the shops, a lot these days, they provide also um, actually a completely linked version of their shop, such that the search engines find these pages and indexes them, right? because only then the shop can sell something. In the 80s, there was no web. Uh, it's like. Early zeros, late 90s, something like that. So how I mean, the numbers would have risen by a factor of 10 or so. More, more than a factor of 10. Um, but I mean, the principle gestalt is still the same. Because now they have more bad, 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 better I don't know. I mean, the problem even is it has become you have many more dynamic pages. At that time, you still had a lot of static pages. right? Now, such a large part of the web is dynamic that, that even the question how many pages are in the web is now a very ill-defined question. Uh, it was even then, but even more so now. Um, yeah. So what does it mean to crawl this? Yeah, it's even, even less clear now. Uh, you have incomplete data, you have some parts are unreachable, or you get timeouts. 
the question is where to start. We cannot observe everything. Um, I will talk later on a bit about bias. You select some part of the picture. You cannot have all the picture. You need to consider that when you investigate it. And yeah, so I have all kind of issues where you have to decide. You have to decide and say, I take this part of the web and this I just am blind to this other part. Um, maybe I skip over that. When you publish something, I mentioned some of the legal and ethical issues that are raised. There are also some famous cases of people who have been fired for providing really good data sets for us. Uh, for example, there was a famous AOL query log case. Who of you knows about that case? Not so many, actually. So there was about, I think it was like 2005 or something in that order. Uh, AOL decided we want to help the researcher community um, and people who want to investigate human behavior, they would really benefit from knowing what users search for, right? And so AOL said, ah, oh, we have this, this search, we have this log of user searches and we provide this log in a pseudonymized form. So we would erase, of course, not, not hand over the, the name but uh, we would say uh, for each pseudonym f what this person searched for. And so they provided that query log. And the researchers were really happy because now for the first time we had a realistic a query log that we could use to tune our systems as, as information retrieval people. It turned out that now quite obviously, at that time it was a bit less obvious, that you can de-anonymize several people. And so some journalists went and uh, de-anonymized some people and went to, let's say, a, a woman somewhere in, in Georgia or so where it was, and said, look, we found these queries. Did you post these queries? And the woman said, yes, that's me. And well, can you guess what are indications for finding a particular person. Searching for their name. If searching for the name is an obvious one. I, and who in this room has never searched for his or her name? So everyone did. Yeah? So, and then of course, for how many names do you have searched in your past years? I mean, that already brings it down from several billions of names to at most a few hundreds, probably only a few dozens. Right? And then, of course, you can look for geography. I mean, you s I would search for Koblenz. It's actually, with a not so common name, it's pretty easy to spot me when you have my query log. And I even use, actually, uh, Google for navigation to find some of my pages. So actually, I, I, I Google very often for, for Stefan Staff even to, to find something that I've put out, rather than going around all kind of web pages. And of course, that's also what people do. So, some AOL manager was fired for that. <laughs> Netflix challenge was similar to that. Who of you knows the Netflix challenge? Oh, a couple of people more. Okay. So the other, so the Netflix challenge was a challenge where they said, we want to learn from you as a machine learning community how best to do recommendations. And we provide you with historical data and we have a certain recommender mechanism. And when you improve this recommendation mechanism by 10 percentage points, we give you a million dollar. A million dollars is a nice incentive, yeah? And, uh, and they handed out the data. I think you had to, to sign some NDA or something like that. Uh, but still, they handed out the data. And a similar thing to the AOL case happened, namely that some people could be de-identified. In this case, because people looked at the ratings of, comp of, of films and linked that to ratings people did on some open platforms. I don't know what platform it was, like MovieDB, IMDb, Rotten Tomatoes, or like IMDb. And by that could link people. Um, 
it was not quite as critical, I would say, as AOL, because the AOL query log was something like, how can I kill my husband or so? So there was other kind of queries. So you didn't have this with the, the movie ratings. But still, again, Netflix could not repeat this kind of challenge. And even Netflix actually would not benefit that much. At some point, someone earned the one million. It was a big engineering endeavor. But the system was never used by Netflix, really, also because then their, their business had moved on, right? Uh, at that time, they were still sending out uh, DVDs. And by the time it was solved, they were basically mostly doing online streaming. So uh, business had moved on, and recommendations wouldn't hold like that anymore. Um, we had a nice example with Delicious. Um, that was owned by, um, I think, at that time, by Yahoo. And we, we had a reviewer for our EU project. And even that reviewer came, ah, oh, you should publish your data. And I said, you're sure? <laughs> it's your data, but uh, you're not a lawyer of Yahoo. <laughs> so um, we published some abstract version of the data. So you would have some network structures, but you wouldn't have the actual content that much. OK. Um, then, of course, when you, when you collect some data and you want to do some publishing, the question is, how do you do it? You could pick a generic format like RDF, which is sometimes quite good, because you can use a lot of APIs to read it, digest it. Sometimes you want to publish it in a way that certain piece of software can digest it. For example, MATLAB, uh, if you want to do some uh, certain kind of analysis, um, network analysis, for example. Um, maybe you want to relate it to other pieces of data, like have unique identifiers for places or for certain, peop or certain peoples. And then the question is, of course, what, how accurately do you publish data? Only yesterday, I pointed a colleague to data we have collected about user reviews. And uh, we have collected uh, like how uh, we have paid people to evaluate the reviews, how useful they are, and, and what they talk about, and so on. And she asked me then, do you have the timestamps of the, of the user reviews? I said, no, we don't have that. <laughs> but that's what she needs for her research, to look not only at reviews, but to look at how reviews develop over time. And so the question is, when you collect data, and maybe even put additional work on this data, and let the crowd do annotate this data, even then the question is, have you published everything <laughs> that might be necessary for another researcher to do a certain kind of study? And we didn't have that kind of timestamp that um, this uh, other fellow researcher wanted to have for her investigation. And you can be very precise. So for example, you just could say, here's the web page. Or you could say, that's a web page at a particular point in time. or the, that's a web page at a particular point in time when I called it from a particular IP address that's here at Copeland's uh, using a certain browser, using a certain history. For example, when you look, want to look into price discrimination, it might be that a web page that is shown with my Mac is different than a web page, the same web page that's shown when you use uh, the Lenovo or another kind of uh, PC. So even from where you call something, with which kind of hardware, may influence what you see. Having such data is, of course, great, because when you have that data, you can really look at price discrimination and see whether some shop gives different prices for the same thing to different people. Um, what is also nice, of course, what we benefit from is software that other people have programmed to collect data from the web. But even that's not without problems, because you may develop a piece of software to scrape a certain web page. And when you publish that software, at least in Germany, you could be sued for the so-called Störerhaftung. Uh, yeah, I think, well, the other Störerhaftung was about the WLAN provisioning. The wireless line provisioning, I think that's sort of like pushed back. But the, the Störerhaftung might still apply when you publish a piece of software that may use the targeted website 
in a way that's not allowed by the terms of service. Right? And, and maybe you do this from a country where it's allowed, but it, it may not be allowed in a different country. Um, yeah, later more by Jerome about our network observatory. And before I talk about modeling the web, I would say let's do now a lunch break. Um, how long have we foreseen for the lunch break? An hour? Yeah, let's, let's do an hour. I think we can all make good use of an hour of break now. And then we regather at, we have now uh, 12.45 at 1.45 here. And I guess you would have some vouchers in your registration bag or something like that. And so I would say, I hope you enjoy lunch. Well, it's just Mensa, but uh, at least I hope you enjoy talking to your peers and, or talking to other people who are still around. See you then at 1.45. Okay, let's start again. It seems we are still missing people, but I fear that we always wait uh, for, let's say, half an hour or so. We will always delay more and more and more. Uh, so I rather establish, okay, five minutes is fine, but then let's just start. Okay? So, where I come back this afternoon? Um, now, given that we have observed some information, the next question is then also, we do want to model the web or aspects of the web. And maybe the question is why? Why do we, even, when I say we want to model the web, why would I say something like this? What would you think does it even mean to model the web or to model the stakeholders or to model the processes or to model the content, why, what do you think does it even mean? Could I repeat? Yeah. I think that Is it on? Yes, now it's on. Exactly. That's a very nice description. You really want to understand how things are connected. You may have different kind of models, but they're all about really understanding, right? And of course you can model different things. I mean, what this picture tries to suggest is we can look at content, right? I mean, we would like also to look at people, but in the end, everything that we can observe is content, including behavior logs, which I would also consider as content again. Um, everything that we look at there is, is content, and we need to model that. Uh, but then, of course, content is not just provided and provided by people. This is also true. But it's also interacting with some algorithm. When I recommend something to you, that influences what you do, right? So when I suggest someone to you on Tinder, you cannot easily go to some completely other person. Well, you can swipe, but uh, you cannot like just pick a random person, right? You, you are limited by recommendations. Um, for example, one uh, PhD student here, he looked at how different recommendations lead to different bookmark structures and how that leads to better or worse performance of the bookmarking retrieval. So we have an interaction here between the algorithm and we need to ask how does the algorithm look like? And all this is embedded in a system. When uh, Maybe what I should point out here, the notion of algorithm depends on the community. But when I, as a computer scientist, use the word algorithm, I mean typically something well constrained. Let's say a particular machine learning algorithm, a clustering algorithm, for example, or some sort of 
statistical algorithm I apply to come up with an explanation. When a social scientist uses the word algorithm, he often rather refers to something what I, as a computer scientist, would refer to as an information system, including not only several algorithms, but also a user interface, also a database, using a very complex thing. So the very notion of algorithm for the different disciplines is quite often already ambiguous. And here in this picture, I rather refer to algorithm as something small and constrained, like, like doing machine learning with a particular well-defined algorithm. And I describe the overall system, which includes interaction with people as social machine. As social because it typically is not influenced only by one person, but by a whole group of people. And it's a machine also, it's, it's driven or uh, it has as foundation a technical system consisting of content, of data, and of algorithms that do rec uh, recommendations that restrict how you see the system or how you see a part of the web. And when we observe something, what we actually, we, we never observe purely all the data or purely all the behavior logs. We always observe the whole social machine. We observe how people have interacted with it. Of course, sometimes that's not very interesting. When I program my, my home page and I just write down here are my hobbies, there is not very much in that social machine other than me providing a few entries. But obviously already when you look at Facebook and you look at how people like things and I learn how people like stuff that I post or not, I might be tempted to post certain kind of things and maybe not post other stuff. Right? When I do political uh, posts, a uh, few people like it. When I just post something like I'm doing this kind of meaningless thing, then 50 people like it. Sorry, let, let me give you the. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. I, I said that it's not fully reflective, but that it also dilutes what's normally happening, right? It's not, it's a sort of abstracted picture that we get. I mean, obviously, let's say uh, we have activities that we pursue, and that at least I have pursued before, before there was a web. Um, it's maybe not true for, all, for you, but uh, so, so there were some activities I pursued even, even then and I pursue now, but maybe now I reflect part of the activities I pursue in the physical world also on the web. But of course, well, I don't report about everything, obviously. Um, actually, about most of the stuff I don't report, so it's a very distorted picture of what you receive of me. Um, I want to go th through one example. I mean, you can say it's a random example, but it's just like an example I have looked at from different angles um, over the last couple of months. Also with some legal colleagues, also some other people like uh, Markus Strohmeyer and Claudia Wagner have looked at it and I, I guess they will actually uh, talk a bit about that on uh, next Wednesday too. But I think um, I, I will provide you some angles. So what kind of biases do we have? First, we have a bias in the device. Why do I show this picture? I show it because Sefi is a, a, a highly remarkable uh, person. Uh, he's severely handicapped, which means basically he cannot move anything below his neck. Right? But he has accomplished enormous things operating the computer, but his mouse is rather uh, just um, a white dot on top of his glasses, and he has constructed himself a mouse which he puts in his mouth and he operates the mouse uh, keys uh, with this mouse that he uh, has in his mouth, the mouse in the mouth. And uh, he has constructed that key using 3D printing himself. And so the way he uses the computer is limited by what he, he can do uh, with, with, with being such severely handicapped. And he's doing great stuff. So there's a whole video about it, what uh, he's doing on, on YouTube. 
uh, when you Google for the name Sefi Udi and, and SolidWorks, you'll find that uh, video. Uh, other people here, uh, a couple of young women we met recently at a project meeting. Uh, again, they look at the web or at, at the computer in general, and they have uh, different forms of uh, muscle dystrophy, uh, or neuromuscular diseases, so they, it's harder and harder for them to control how they interact with the computer. Now, the way you, um, you present content to them and the way the tools are shaped influence how they can even use the computer. For example, they have less and less fine-grained control over the mouse, so they can pick something. So we try also to reshape the computer experience, but we are then, for example, limited by cause in order to reshape the experience for them, what we would like to get is the meaning of the individual widgets. For example, the meaning that something is a text box. Now you might say, ah, I learned HTML. The text box is really simple to understand because it's just form and it's a form element in HTML. That was the good old times. That's no longer anymore. Right now, a text box in JavaScript can be something really complex. For example, the Google search text box is not so easy to identify as a text box in general. I mean, you can do it individually for Google, but in general, it's quite complicated. Uh, there are means for that, like HTML5 semantics of what your widget is about, whether it's about navigation or whether it's about text input or output and so on. But understanding that and turning this into something is, is a challenge. And that influences. It also influences us. When we use it on the mobile, we have other kind of influences than when we use the full screen and the, the, the full keyboard. It influences, and it's very visible here, uh, with really uh, highly intriguing people and uh, who do surprising things, uh, but who are uh, in ways, in certain ways, handicapped. OK, here are some pointers. Um, or we have bias in the software. Um, here are some infamous examples. I must say, for example, uh, the more and more search engines categorize images. Uh, now here under this link you will find some uh, article by New York Times that reports about the fact that when Google researchers tried to categorize images and then provided that service, that's nice, right? But then white people, and that's why uh, it's called the, the intelligence white guy problem. White people, let's say white guys, were classified as white guys. But some black people were classified as apes. How does it come? I mean, it was not bad will by the software developers, but you take an algorithm, you take certain piece of data and train it with certain piece of data, and you get a distortion, right? You get a distortion that the algorithm behaves in a, in a, in a highly undesirable manner, uh, providing you some highly undesirable classification. No bad will involved at all, right? But just the, the algorithm has consequences that you don't want. Job advertisements. Uh, there were some, quite some intriguing papers where, where people re-engineered what's happening on LinkedIn and created artificial accounts and created artificial accounts with likewise history and likewise job attributes and experiences and found that a female, they had artificial accounts where the only difference between accounts was, was it male or female. And then the females were offered fewer good, well-paid positions than the males. So again, I don't think there was any bad intent by the LinkedIn developers, but they pick up certain pieces from the, the data, learn about them, and then draw generalizing conclusions that are not in the intent of the developer. And of course, then you could even say, well, let's just not look at this attribute, male or female, right? Uh, or let's uh, not handle that. And that's currently done. So when you look into um, an insurance company, for example, and they have to provide health insurance tariffs, they're not supposed to look into that attribute uh, of gender. But does it help? Well, it doesn't really help always. If you look at gender or sex here, it's correlated, for example, with height. Right? If you measure the height of a person, which would you, you would do for maybe some, some health insurance, life insurance contract, because you want to know how healthy is the person, 
is the person two meters tall and 50 kilograms light or the other way around. Um, that is, of course, an initial condition for giving a health insurance. So measuring that seems to be legitimate. But then, of course, you know that guys tend to be 10 centimeters taller than women. Of course, it's not a perfect predictor, but you have a certain correlation that you might pick up and then misuse again to sell insurance tariffs that are gender-based. And there is a law against gender-based health insurance tariffs. So uh, you might end up with a conclusion that you are not supposed to reach. The same ethnicity is another one of these characteristics which are forbidden by law to be misused in order to um, offer goods in the web, like an insurance contract. But obviously, in some areas of London, you will have, let's say, certain areas where you have a um, more proportion, higher proportion of Chinese or Indians or, or this and that. So uh, a zip code might tell you quite a bit about uh, ethnicity. Of course, it's not a perfect predictor. And there may be 20% of other ethnicities live there, or 40%, whatever. But it's a correlation that feeds into some good that's offered to you or not, or for a better or worse price. Yeah, so uh, Claudia probably will talk a bit about what they did, looking at uh, Wikipedia and how they found that uh, female are presented, females are differently presented than males. And, or another example is you have the same kind of social network and you look at uh, what is the majority opinion. I had a typical problem when you look at Twitter and, and you ask yourself, what is the majority opinion on Twitter? And does it then represent the general um, opinion? Here we have a, a small artificial example and what you see in these two examples is it's exactly the same network structure, and it's exactly the same number of two opinions. The opinions are red or white, whatever red and white means, Brexit or not Brexit, or remain or leave, or uh, the other favorite problem that you want to poll about. Then in one of the two networks, when you look around, the majority is red, and in the other network, the majority is white. How does it come? Well, let's look at the network. So, for example, let's look at this guy here with a white opinion. It has one, two, three neighbors. They're all red. Well, actually, here's one neighbor which is white. But majority vote for this one is red. Majority vote for that one is red, red, nothing else. For this one, red, red. Okay, so you can go through the whole circle and you see the A circle, in spite of the fact that there are only a few nodes here that are red, the majority is, is red. In the same circle, it's exactly the same structure. Uh, you do the same kind of test and you see this guy here is white and white in the neighborhood. White, white, white in the neighborhood. And so on and so forth. So it even depends on how you poll the data. And depending on how you do it, you find that the majority goes in the one direction or it goes in the other direction. Again. You will use an algorithm to do this, to do the crawling. That will be influenced. Um, another example about bias. Here we wanted to exploit bias. That was a PhD thesis submitted now in, our, uh, in, in my group by Christoph Kling. And he looked at geographic distribution, um, in this case of um, uh, food photographs. He did not look at the image itself, but only at the tags. Tags were of these food uh, um, food images on Flickr, uh, pasta and shrimp or wine, pizza wine, whatever, whatever kind of tag combinations you would have. People would upload a photo on Flickr. And the interesting thing why he did that was because with photos you, you quite often have geo-coordinates. And with the geo-coordinates, you can actually also create a bias. Um, why do you, why may, do you may want to do this? Well, what you're typically interested in when you analyze data is you want to find clusters. Does any one of you know what a cluster is? I mean, many of you, I guess, use clustering methods, but what a cluster is in the abstract? Exactly, right? So when you do clustering, 
you are interested in finding groups where each group, the individuals are similar to other people in the same group or other data points in the same group and are at the same time different from all the other data groups, okay? Um, and, well, of course, you might want to find when you look at these kind of tags, stuff like what are similar dishes. Maybe you have a seafood cluster and a red meat cluster and, and a pasta cluster and, and the likes. Yeah? And then the question also is, when is the cluster a good cluster? It depends, of course. Maybe you have a particular application. Then that application gives you the quality. The other kind of means that you have is when you look at the cluster, is it natural for you? Because we all have a conceptualization of things in our mind. And that, of course, depends on what we know. So these clusters, our concepts do not exist uh, on a blank tablet, but they exist based on our cognition that we have. And, well, I guess for many people here in the room, it would be natural to say that we have a fish cluster or fish and seafood cluster, a red meat cluster, or maybe a pasta cluster. Maybe that would be completely unnatural for Japanese uh, because basically they have all kind of seafood and vegetarian and then they have uh, just very little meat. <laughs> and even less so in the past. So, so, so the kind of cluster that I indicated makes sense for a certain group of people, may not need sense for, uh, for other groups of people. The, his observation there was you can bias the algorithm by providing more input by providing GPS coordinates. Because food is influenced by where you take the food. Well, I mean, you are offered different food in Germany. You may like it or not. Well, maybe not. But uh, then you, if you go to India or the States or Italy or so. And uh, that's what he did, actually. So he took the position of the image and thus of the food as a further indicator. And this actually allowed to provide better clusters, come up with better clusters. And how did he prove that it's better clusters? Well, well maybe I should focus on that. He did a kind of intrusion experiment. And the uh, intrusion experiment, he showed the cluster to people and put entities in there that were wrong, that were intentionally wrong. If you have nice clusters, it's easy to determine this outlier. If it's bad clusters, it's hard to find the one outlier among the, all the other outliers, <laughs> because bad clusters consist mostly of outliers. And then if you could compare, and you would see, yes, if you provide a bias in terms of geography, you're better able to identify outliers than if you don't use geography. For example, here, uh, maybe chicken is an outlier in this, but rice maybe is also a bit an outlier in this, and here in this, it's maybe a bit more homogeneous. It's not a perfect prediction, but, but uh, you can evaluate that and come with some kind of intrusion detection, and then his model was better than the others. So again, you have bias in a different way. In this case, it's even a good way. And what we must be aware of, of course, is when we use these algorithms, each algorithm always has a bias. It, because when we do, uh, do data analysis, we cannot come without bias. Why not? Because we want to generalize. And there is no unique way of generalizing. Let's look at the room here. How would, when we look at people, how would we generalize? Well, would that one, there would be one easy way of generalizing would be, let's look at, uh, at gender according to how we look like, right? Of course, that may even be, uh, uh, that, uh, may be de deceitful. Uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, one may look male and it's female or the other way around. But in general, that would be one way of generalizing. Maybe it may be a very stupid way, right? When we look at science, it's a very stupid way of look at, at classifi uh, classifying people. We can look at skin color. We can look at discipline. We can look at all kinds of things of classifying. It depends then, of course, what we want to do with this information. Do we want to send people to the bathroom? Then maybe classifying according to gender is the social habit to do. Uh, if you want to classify according, I don't know, into vegetarians or non-vegetarians, that's maybe the right thing for planning for dinner. So. Um, we want to generalize, but an algorithm will 
one algorithm generalized in a different way than the next algorithm. And this may lead to problems or to the desired effect. Um, and then, of course, well, we learn from the past and we generalize from the past and maybe the past was not what we desired. For example, there was an interesting paper uh, at ICWSM a couple of weeks ago in Cologne, just one, one hour down the, the Rhine, and it looked at predicting whether an empl uh, employee would leave the company based on the vocabulary this person would use in his or her emails. So and for that purpose, the company gave that researcher complete access to, to emails in a mid-sized company with a lot of data. And yes, the more the emails were different in vocabulary from other vocabulary in the company, the higher the prediction that this person would leave the company or would be fired. And of course, there was also a ramp up phase when people joined the company they would use different vocabulary and then they would adapt to the voca vocabulary of within the, com uh, the company. And now the question, of course, that this is not answer is, do these people fail because they just don't learn what is important for the company? They don't adapt? Or do they get fired because they don't adapt to the awful habits that this company has? Right? I mean, maybe they have just a very uh, a behavior in the company, a style that's actually not very fruitful for the people uh, as social beings and, and for the company to be a successful company. That's not answered. The only thing there is that there is a prediction done that there, someone will leave the company. And the question is, should they not hire the person or should they change the behavior of the company? And that's not answered by the past. But if you do a prediction and you do it in a naive way, you will just maybe fire the people, people earlier or, or not hire them. Um, you have bias and you have processes. I mean, you have to look at how do people, how does this whole social machine evolve around bias? Uh, for example, Wikipedia now looks into how people are presented on Wikipedia. Maybe describe a female, uh, females in a l way that's not so different from the males, right? So in this example before, females were more often described in terms of the husbands, but not the other way around. I mean, of course, you could either add the spouse information to the, the males or discard the spouse information from the females. Um, or in law, actually, you have these, I mentioned these protected characteristics and there are processes that are of things that you are not allowed to do legally. Whether they are still done, that's another question, but you are not allowed to do to discriminate based on age, disability, gender, unless, again, there is a legitimate cause. I mean, you can actually discriminate according to age when you're a health insurance or, or let's say a life insurance company and you don't have to give the same rate to an 80 year old than you give to an 18 year old, right? There's a legitimate cause uh, not to give a life insurance contract to an 80 year old, typically. Okay, so I'm running a bit short on time. I will um, skip this because these are a couple of slides, but I think I will rather let Jerome do some talking too. Um, um, let me summarize the bias case study. When we look at this effect of bias, we see all kind of bias in the device. We see bias in the content, let's say at Wikipedia. We see bias and we have to investigate what are the processes that lead to this bias. The social process, also the technical processes. How is the data collected? Does our data collection lead to a bias that we don't want? Right? Like with this example with the white guy problem, that then uh, black people are classified in the wrong way. That's clearly a data collection problem. Um, which algorithms are used? How do they generalize? Do they generalize in the intended way or maybe not? How is then the algorithm also embedded in the system process? I mean, I mentioned uh, that our former PhD student class, I mean he 
finished several years ago. When he looked, he, he used the same recommender algorithms, but applied it differently on the data. And one way of recommending was more fruitful for the system than the other way. So it may be the same under, you could say, okay, you have a classification algorithm like uh, support vector machines or some statistical processing like linear regression or, or logistic regression. The question is also how do you apply it on your data? And lead, does this lead to some desired or undesired bias? What are the system effects? Maybe you have a system that reinforces some desired or some undesirable behavior, right? Sort of like maybe you, you in LinkedIn, you prefer males with their uh, jobs and, and earning a lot of money, and maybe once you, you have this suggestion and this is implemented, it's again observed by the system and reinforced. And so it becomes an ever stronger effect in the worst case. Hmm? It doesn't move on now. And of course, when we have bias, we, we have to ask ourselves the question, especially when we work together in disciplines, what is, why do we investigate it? Now, why do we investigate things? That gave me a lot of headaches in interdisciplinary uh, collaborations over my research lifetime uh, because the purposes are so different. So the typical social science uh, purpose is to observe something. So for example, here it would be observe bias as it happens. The typical engineering, computer science thing is to do something in order to have some system behavior. For example, a correct classification. Um, maybe in the social sciences you also want to have do intervention, but maybe the intervention would rather work in that you change how people use a system rather than changing the system. Um, and maybe in system sciences you would like to understand the limits or the reinforcement processes. When I worked together with physicists, they were still different because they didn't care much about the overall outcome. They were more interested in the micro model of how uh, people, how, how to say, it, what the physical laws of the system were and what the structures of these laws were. They didn't care so much about the outcome, whether that was beneficial or not. The social scientists typically would care about the outcome as you would be the computer scientist, the physicist just wanted to have a model that explains what's happening underneath. Yeah, engineers want to build a proper technical system. Um, when we have now such an example like a bias, we can model it in very different ways. And I want to go very quickly over this. The, the different methods that I distinguish here like three one, uh, uh, threefold. The first is descriptive, then predictive, and then generative. And what I do here is again like I oversimplify quite a bit. So for the descriptive model you have already seen one example. That's good because I can be quick with this slide. That's a descriptive model of the web and how it's linked. It simply says there are some web pages that are strongly linked to each other. There are other web pages that we point to but that don't point out. Uh, and there are web pages that point to us but no one points to them. That's a descriptive model and you even have certain numbers here, some statistics on, on how these group, how big these groups are. That's a descriptive model. Uh, it, the model would not need to be structural like this. It could just be a textual description. It could just describe um, what are the entities that they are related and that they may be fall in some classes and that we have some descriptive statistics. What we in computer science often want to have are predictive models, well also in other disciplines obviously, but I mean I would say that quite often in social sciences you have quite often more a model like this in a very abstract sense, <laughs> not exactly like this, but in a very abstract sense, because the relationships that you describe are very complex. And um, in order to have these rich relationships, you are often satisfied with a more descriptive model than uh, the, 
while in predictions you really try to say, if this and this and this holds, I classify you into this or that class. Um, now a simple predictive model would be like, and I think uh, these uh, slides are from Fraser Rome, that you have some connections, and Nosh suggested that this morning that um, in one way to recommend new friends to you on, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, on, on whatever kind of social network platform is that when, when that's me and these are other people, and I know this guy and these other guys, then I can just count how, of, how many ways exist, how I can reach this person. And if there are more ways to reach this person, if I have more friends in common, then I might establish this link rather than the link from, from me to this person there. Well, because there's a larger community that we share and there's more trust that um, this may be the right person that I should contact. So a standard algorithm is really find me friends of friends and if someone is connected to many of my friends, that's a good suggestion to do. So that's a simple prediction for a recommender system. Now the third kind of model is typically a bit um, more difficult. Namely, in the third kind of model, you try to capture the non-determinism of human nature. It could also be the non-determinism of a physical system, right? Uh, statistical mechanics talks about um, molecular dynamics, and that's also non-deterministic because the, the elements are so small, it's not quite foreseeable how they really bump into each other, for example. And you can understand humans in that way, that they behave non-deterministically. So when we meet each other, we may befriend each other on, on or follow on, on Twitter or not. And there is a certain, a large amount of non-determinism whether we do or not. Um, and uh, the idea of these generative models is to say that we model activities by probabilities. And we don't claim that um, a particular connection is good. We only say that a particular connection is more likely. And when I model my system like that, I can come up with certain laws. For example, observe that my network has a nice property, like it's a small work network, that's derived from such a model. A simple example is the barabasi albert model. And um, the barabasi albert model basically says two things. We have a network, and this network is growing. You could apply this to many networks. It could be the web, web pages. It could be research literature. It could be um, Facebook friendship graph. It doesn't matter. It could be one of these networks. And if a new node joins the graph, how does this node behave? You know, Barabasi Albert basically says that, well, that new node is more likely to connect to a node that already has many connections. Well, it's a bit like what Nosh explained to say that you observe some all people are talking to Uli, so if I'm a new node, I should also talk to Uli. So Barabasi Albert models this basically by saying, well, the, prob the probability that a new node talks to a particular node that already is in the network is proportional to the number of nodes that this node has. Well, if, if Uli is connected to all of you, I'm a new node that joins, the probability that I talk to Uli will be like the number of people in the room. And let's say if Jerome just came in, uh, still before me, and knows no one, then I would connect to Jerome with a lower probability. And that's a generative model because it doesn't make really a statement about any particular node that I would join. It just says something about kind of probabilities. And what is important are not the individual connections, but what is important are just the, it's just the overall structure that arises and that I observe. It's also a model, it also does some sort of quotation mark prediction, but at a diff somewhat different layer. So that's more like a model that the physicists would do, um, and which gives us interesting conclusions, but different conclusions than the kind of predictive model that we had before. One kind of conclusion that we observe is that the result is scale-free. Scale-free like this, uh, I don't know what this cabbage is, particular kind of cabbage, uh, 
um, Romanesco. Uh, and the interesting thing about Romanesco is it looks the same no matter at which scale you consider it. So it has a certain shape, and when you just take this part, it has the same shape. And when you just take this part, it has still the same shape, but at a different scale. So that's a scale-free uh, vegetable. And when you look at a scale-free network, it's like this. Every time you cut something out of that network, it has the same kind of shape as the original network. Um, OK. So these are three kind of typical models that we do as web scientists. Um, now, as a web scientist, and in, uh, with the aim at classifying the web a bit and, and how we as web scientists investigate the web, we, I also wanted to do a bit of a prediction uh, in the future, or at least in, 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 the, in the present. Um, the prediction in the present is so difficult in the web because quite often something happens right as we speak, and we only learn five years later that it was really important. At least to me, this happens quite a lot. Um, now, I have here some history of the web, and Again, for reason of time, I will skip much of it. The main message that I want to bring you with this history of the web was that many of the concepts existed way before the web. The whole idea of hypertext exists, dates back to 45 at least, one of a bush, as we may think, and the Memex system that he drew up in his fruitful article of 45. And then, Hypertext was crafted as a term, coined as a term in 62, um, and, and, and only it, it received really widespread attention when the web was created uh, and, and afterwards as of the middle of the 90s. Um, we had the question about what the internet is. Um, the internet is a kind of a result of letting compu computers communicate with each other. So, so the question was raised in the 60s. In the 60s, there was the first wide area network connecting the, the West Coast and the East Coast of the USA. And the idea was to let computers communicate. And uh, with hard to understand or hard to use protocols, but you could ship some bits and bytes from the East Coast to the West Coast and vice versa with this wide area network you know, over a long distance. And later on, the internet was nothing else than such a wide area network where the protocols were standardized, so it didn't matter which computer you would use. They would just follow the protocol in order to ship bits and bytes from here to there. Yes? No, net just means that each net is a local area network, network, and that network follows a certain kind of protocols. And there's, there are many protocols. Even nowadays, we have many protocols. At that time, there were other protocols around. There was a token ring infrastructure around that followed a certain kind of protocol to communicate within such a room. And there is, right now, we have different kind of networks. For example, we have a mobile network. Yeah. Yeah, we have LTE, for example. That's one kind of network to connect computers with each other. Yeah. And, but then we don't communicate using LTE between here and the States, but we use one network, let's say LTE, for my mobile to connect to a mobile provider. And then the mobile provider uses internet to connect to uh, a station that then uses glass fiber to connect with glass fiber, let's say from Frankfurt to Boston maybe, or New York. And uh, then within New York, there's another connection from the glass fiber entry in New York to Wall Street. And so I can get some piece of information from Wall Street crossing over several different networks. And that's, there are these different networks and they are connected by the internet. Okay, yeah. Uh, and the connection to the internet, so it's a broader term to 
So it's, it's a lower level because basically, basically you can say, for example, we have here, let's say, uh, mo um, wireless, Wi-Fi, or we have uh, fiber, glass fiber, or we have uh, DSL, PowerNet, whatever. We have many protocols. On top of that, we have a common layer, which is TCP IP, which is like the typical kind of internet protocols. And they explain how I can ship um, a package of bytes from here to there, even via several stations. On top of that, we have the application level where the web sits, where we, for example, have HTML, which explains how, what is a document? A document is a hypertext, uh, uh, which explains that a heading in the document is explained by the tag H1. And we have HTTP for transferring such a document, hypertext transfer protocol. And uh, we have URLs in order to find the document worldwide. And uh, yeah, and so you have several kind of layers that connect a distributed set of computers. But here we talk about physical layers, for example. Here we talk about shipping bits and bytes. And here we talk about shipping documents and what the documents mean. So it's, it's a, a horizontal and vertical spread that we have here. Well, the web is most, there, there are two, I would say, two different uses of the word web. You can use web just to refer to this layer. You can, of course, also use web to refer to all layers. And also, pass pro toto, the word internet has also been used for the part or for the whole, right? I mean, you have all this uh, metonymical speaking of uh, pass pro toto or toto pro partem. Uh, where you use one part to speak for, to talk about the whole and vice versa. And in Germany, people talk about the internet and really mean everything. And in the, I don't know about the states, are probably the same. Um, the other message what I want to bring about out here is, so the web as you will see on the next slide, the concept of the web was drafted in 89 by Tim Berners-Lee. In 83, AOL was founded to, to support the gaming community and to support exchange between gamers. And already then, in 83, and actually even a bit before, there were consumer information services and email. You already had communities that counseled each other on software development as well as on life issues like on breakup of relationships and, and, and all the likes. So if you think in terms of the web is helping with private lives, that's happened already around that time. Only at that time, there were only geeks who, who were on these, in these communities. AOL changed that a bit, broadened it a bit. It was not yet a mass phenom phenomenon, but was already like bringing hundreds of thousands of customers into the proprietary community that AOL was. And uh, yeah, then the web concept, that means this layer, was drafted in 89. And then in 93, the first browser, graphical browser, was launched. And, and from with this graphical browser, as of 93, then there came the explosion you know. And then, of course, you can sort of like look at what were the individual stations, how fast did it develop, and uh, when, when was Amazon started as an uh, e-commerce provider? When was Wiki created? And then you see all the, Google was only created in 98, actually quite rather late. Um, when was the semantic web created? In, in 99, as an idea. And uh, yeah, you have all this history about web 2 applications like Wikipedia, Facebook, where then around that time, Mass, uh, many people started to generate content. Before, you always had to, pro to do HTML programming, at the least, to have your website. And then with Facebook and, and Wikipedia and the like, 
you could more easily generate content without learning HTML. Web 2.0, exactly, there was that area. And yeah, and of course it continues. Now, in order to do my prediction, what I put in these slides here is the following. And I asked myself the question, and I was the not the first one to do so, what was the development behind these different applications? Well, first, there is the internet and the computer networks that deliver packets. Actually, documents is not even the perfect name, rather packets of bits and bytes. And then, basically, with Mosaic, in 1993, we had like a kind of a web of documents. And that was changed into, around 2000, a web of data. Because you had the semantic web, you had RDF, and even Facebook, you can say, is a kind of a web of data because you like something or not. That's a piece of data. You indicate on Facebook your name uh, and your birth date, if you want. That's a piece of data. And you can query Facebook using the Facebook API, which is a graph query interface. So it's a web of data, what you have there with Facebook. And in Wikipedia, uh, it's not only text, but it's actually also data. Now, I draw, these years are always a bit unclear, and I picked some years and indicated here that, for example, I said the, the web of data exists because of Wikipedia being um, started in 2001. That's a random choice. You could pick another application, and it would be started in 2000 or 2002 or 2003. So that's some indicative year. It's not like the final saying. Um, then the, you have the web of documents. The web of data is more fine-grained. Rather than having just text, you now talk about a name, a year, a like. With the web of services, you go beyond that, because then you do not only have my name, which is pretty stable, but you have a service that may, might indicate uh, or give me the way to do some transaction. And this service might be composed. I mean, even then, the question is, when do we have a web of services? E-shopping, Amazon, you saw, was already around 95. But then having services that are composed I came a bit later. For example, here I picked 2005 because then the website Programmable Web was founded. And the idea behind Programmable Web was to collect APIs on the web that you could use and put together into new applications. So the idea of putting services together to make something more powerful, that was then really became mainstream with 2005. And every one of you uses that now, because every website you use is not only, let's say, the shopping website, but it uses, for example, several advertisement networks. So no single provider does operates his own advertisements, but people just put the advertisement from, from Google or some other advertisement network on their web page and make a benefit from that. So even when you provide a service, it's not your service only, but it's at least an advertisement service next to it. And maybe there's a like that you put, uh, a Facebook like that you put uh, in the, the lower end, and that's a service because the Facebook likes are tracked by Facebook and if it's liked, there's another service that's operated. So even a simple website that you operate now and that looks like a document, it's not a document, but it's actually a set of services that are composed with each other. And then we have the web of things, um, which includes all kinds of sensors and actors. So you do not only want to have a service that does some software operation for you, but some sensor that tells you the temperature in Southampton or Koblenz. And we have more and more web of people, because when you think about what Uber or Airbnb or couch serving or online dating is doing, it's really not so much about delivering documents as it is about connecting people, right? So when you do couch serving, 
you try to find someone who offers you a couch or an airbed or whatever. Uh, uh, the same for Uber. You, you try to find someone who uh, provides you some transport. So it's coordinating people rather than just delivering documents. Um, now, when I talk about the web of things, why do I think that's particularly interesting? Because right now we have most an internet of things. An internet of things makes you can, means you can communicate with things like, like a temperature sensor. And uh, well, you have a value. But the web of things is still not quite here because it's still not quite clear. And that's now where I start to predict the future. Maybe it's the, the present because maybe people are doing it this day. I think they are. And ask themselves the question, how do I take basic services that are behind the web and use them? And what are the basic services behind the web? I uh, have to go forward. Sorry. The basic services, for example, behind the web of documents is to identify a document, to link a document, to retrieve a document. It's this idea of, I mean, how, how do I get the right document? I do it by identifying the document. How, how do I identify the right piece of data? For those of you who know semantic web, you use a URI to identify a piece of data. How do I identify a service? I mean, programmable uh, web was nothing else than an inventory of APIs that you can identify and then use to build up a complex service. How do I identify a person? Well, I identify a person for example, by its org ID, which is a researcher ID, or by a Facebook ID, or a LinkedIn ID, maybe by some open authority ID that connects typically with Facebook or a Google ID. And I need that for the Internet of Things. I want to identify a particular sensor. And I want to link these sensors. Because maybe I want to link 10 sensors, because one sensor may give me the wrong value, because it's broken. So I may want to link 10 sensors, temperature sensors, and ask for what is the, the, the medium value, what is the median value, in order to find, let's say, 10 temperature sensors in Koblenz. But it's still unclear what does it mean, really, to link sensors or things in the web. And things are not only sensors, but also actors. Maybe some robots that are programmed by the web. How do I discover sensors? How do I know how many sensors are on this campus? It's still unclear. Right? But that would be a typical web question. I would like a search engine to give me all the sensors here on the campus. Um, how do I search for them? Maybe I just want to find the sensors that give me temperature, or just the sensors that indicate the presence of people here on the campus. Or I may want to know how many observation cameras here are here on the campus? Maybe I'm not allowed to ask this question, but. And Web of People. Um, that's um, a funny cartoon that I really love. And it was in the 90s, there was this cartoon on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Right? You can behave as you want. You can be a male and you can act as if you're a female. Uh, you can be a dog and act as if you're a researcher. And I had this experience because uh, when the, the semantic web was still young, uh, I also like to tell the story, and then we had this mailing list and there were a couple of dozen of people on that mailing list talking about the semantic web. And then we had some meeting and up to this meeting there came this guy. This guy at that time was about 12, 13 years old. And everyone knew his name. No one knew that he was a 12 year old guy exchanging expert opinions about RDF. And then he really drafted uh, the rich site summary in, uh, using RDF at the age of 14, which was a kind of a standard, was used he later on created a company and sold that. And there's some tragic story behind uh, the, st uh, the story of Aaron Swartz, because, because he was fighting for, for free data, free literature, and was threatened by FBI for that, and then committed suicide. So I uh, can... Uh, I recommend you uh, to, to read up on it. There's even a film about it, The Internet's Own Boy, uh, about Aaron Swartz. And he was that guy who, 
who was on that mailing list, and everyone thought it was like a software developer, 30 years of age or something. It was a 12-year-old old, uh, uh, boy. Uh, and then coming to the meeting for the first time, and uh, uh, it was, that was like a dog would be despicable, and that would not quite honor his contribution. But um, it was definitely this kind of effect. You just wouldn't know that's a boy behind it. And, and now, of course, the, it's different because now it's more like our metadata analysis indicates that he's definitely a brown Labrador and he lives with a white and black spotted beagle mix and I suspect they're hunting, right? I mean, that's what is now known probably about you, right? Sort of like that you, even if you are 12, would be a 12-year-old boy, um, a person would probably know about that even when you do uh, contributions to the semantic web mailing list and it looks like you're uh, like an old software developer. Okay, so identification. And now, again, the same question when we talk about the web of people. Identification is the issue. And what, is, what do we want to do with this identification? What's happening at, at the right time right now is that everywhere people are building up trust scores, just as one example. Uber builds up a trust score. Um, I'm, I'm broken on that. My first Uber ride, I got a, a score of one because, well, I'll tell you that another time. <laughs> but Airbnb builds up trust scores. And what uh, eBay builds up trust scores. And what do you do with these trust scores? You decide to bring someone to your home or not, to uh, do business with the person or not. Uh, in the future, maybe Uber will decide to give this person a, an autonomous driving car or not. I mean, if that has a bad Uber score, maybe he would leave the car in a, in a bad state, right? Unless he's trusted by someone, uh, by other people. A Tinder score is like that, yeah, of course. Um, or other matching sites, you would probably have uh, some scores. Um, uh, there's this Chinese social score that the government wants to give where the group that you're in receives a score, and when this group raises too many open opinions, then the score goes down. Um, so that's, I would say, also a less desirable score to have. Uh, all of you basically have a credit rating score. And there are a couple of companies out there that now look on your Facebook profile, your Twitter profile, um, how these kind of profiles influence your credit rating scores. It's still in the beginning, but it's happening. There are startups that do exactly this. So for all of these different webs of documents, data, services, things, and people, you have some things that occur again and again and again and again. You always have some sort of identification of the document, the piece of data, the service, the uh, thing, the person, and you connect things. You connect documents, you connect pieces of data, you say this Paris is the same as that Paris, you connect uh, services together as a, in a service mesh, you connect things into a more reliable aggregation of things, or you connect people uh, for all kinds of reasons to, to give them a, a, a group score or to let them date, or what, for whatever kind of reason. And you see that for the first couple of layers, you have stable standards. For the upper layers, there are no standards. I'm not even sure if we want them, but uh, that's something we can all discuss. Uh, I think for Web of Things, yes, we want standards. For web of People, we have de facto standards. I mean, um, I guess, who has not logged in using Facebook account ever? I mean, you can, there are all kinds of applications where you log in with your Facebook account. I, I, and I guess, it, hmm? Yeah? Never logged in, yeah. And also never for with your Google account or? Never, okay, there are few people. Okay. So, but I think it's, it's quite common that you use Google identification or Facebook authentication. It's all using open authority standard to do this. But then, of course, you are linkable across all different sites. You're also linkable by other means. Don't, 
don't worry about that, right? <laughs> and yeah, so that concludes this observation of the present, maybe I should rather say, than a prediction of the future. Um, and I would hand over to Jerome at this point. Yeah, but of course, if you have thoughts about that, that would also be a good point for a couple of minutes discussion. So, maybe you repeat. Would you say that some of the semantic web analogies I developed earlier are sort of determinative effects of the behavior of the subject? Like, are they sort of built into the structure? I think some of the semantic web standards are in so widespread use, there are stand de facto standards now. So, I think the most used one is schema.org because all major website operators use it. I mentioned these three trillion facts that correspond to schema.org. So if you use schema.org, you're pretty sure that search engines on the web will understand you. Uh, some of schema.org is even used by intelligent assistants, like uh, Google Mail also uses schema.org. So that's already an ontology that's used a lot. Um, Forth is used quite a bit. I don't know which commercial tools would use it at this point, I must confess, but it's, it's used quite a bit in, in more experimental software. And uh, there are other ones uh, uh, in the, the medical areas. There are kind of standard ontologies uh, that are used. So we'll still see more. For example, ones that are currently under discussion for the sensors, there is a uh, um, sensor network ontology, I think SNO is called. And I have not seen much widespread use, but the problem is strong to use a semantic description of sensors. And why? There are tens of thousands of different sensors. When I mean different sensors, I don't mean the same temperature sensor twice. I mean different products. And the companies have the problem that they build a system, and next year they, they cannot buy the same sensor again. They can only buy an improved sensor. Now, for a company who operates an industry for all, industry 4.0 application, an improved sensor may be worse because it requires a different piece of software to handle the sensor. So you, you, you really want a rich sensor description that you can plug into your software and the software can adapt itself to the new type of sensor. So you want that. We're not quite there that we know how to, to do this simple plugin. And in practice, this sensor ontology is not used yet, but I think it's really needed by industry. About the sensor ontology, could you say the sensor ontology? Uh, the which ontology? The sensor, sensor ontology, yeah. This somehow uh, is the thing that helps the model. So when I first looked also at this issue of sensors, I thought, I mean, how many sensors could there be? How many different types? It turns out it's an incountable number, more or less. It's even the case, so one of our PhD students moves on now to a company who builds application-specific sensors. So uh, for example, in the food processing industry, you may need all kinds of sensors that observe how food um, evolves as it's processed and it, as it's delivered. And, and then maybe the, the sensor for some sushi would be different than the sensor for some meat would be different for some sensor for some pasta and so on and so forth. And for example, this, this company is very successful developing new sensors every day, new types of sensors. And that can be a combination of things, a combination of temperature, um, and uh, maybe even some recording of the temperature, maybe even some hum humidity, and, and I don't know, right? It's far more uh, types of sensors than I could have ever imagined. And sensor combinations too, of course. So that 
Um, yes, I think you can still, you, you still have kind of, when, when I say different sensors, it could mean that your particular sensor is active only in a particular range. Because if you have a, sense, if you have a temperature sensor, for example, there's no temperature sensor that works from zero degrees Kelvin to 10,000 degrees Kelvin, right? So the sensor range is typically pretty small. And for uh, a flu sensor, when you, when you have temperature, uh, well, you need a certain range of between 30 degrees Celsius and 42 degrees Celsius. You're just interested in that range, and primarily 37 to 39 or so. Uh, if you are, have a food sensor, you're probably rather interested in, I don't know, minus, minus 18 until 25. So you have different ranges. You have different reliabilities. You have different uh, reli reliability in terms of how long it lasts, how long the battery lifetime is, how long this and that is. So, so they may still all measure temperature, but even with just measuring temperature, you can come up with an infinite number of sensors. I don't know. You tell me. You're, you're, the, wrong, you're the young aspiring researcher. <laughs> I really don't know. Sometimes I would suggest just like trying to figure out what the next sensor will be. You know what I mean? Like x-rays or, you know, like, you know, I mean. Oh, x-rays are a bit outdated by now, yeah. but. <laughs> no, yeah. so yesterday I heard a talk. And for example, they built robots to inspect luggage left on, uh, at the railway station. And then they use, for example, terahertz sensing. And with the terahertz sensing, they, they send the robot. So if that's the bag that's left behind, and then, then the robot tries to sense what could be in this bag. Or should we um, just let it explode? Uh, or should we just open it because it only has dirty underwear? Uh, so, uh, that's, of course, a typical question that arises every day at the uh, airports. And, well, we have seen enough terrorism attacks on airports or, or, or train stations, right? And, uh, yeah. So, yes, you have infrared, X-ray, terahertz, you name it. It's infinite number, basically. Okay. So, I hand over to Jerome. <laughs>